Hi, I'm Electron John. As you can see, I've got quite a few different types of battery related tools when it comes to high voltage electric vehicles. And, you know, I've got the capabilities with the existing equipment out in the industry to diagnose all kinds of problems. I can even go ahead and diagnose a problem with the high voltage battery pack, as we can see on the scan tool here. But the problem that I have with the high voltage battery diagnostics is what happens if I don't get that far in my diagnostics? Let's say the complaint happens to be that the vehicle will not accept the charge. So that's kind of frustrating because we have two different areas that could cause that. One could be the actual EVSE, electric vehicle service equipment. We commonly call it a charger and the other could be a problem on the vehicle side of things. So with some vehicles, we have, as soon as we plug a cable into the, into the charging port on the car, a little green light will, will actually illuminate, um, it'll just illuminate steady until it actually starts charging, or maybe a horn will sound, whatever the case happens to be. Those are primarily the newer style vehicles. The older ones pretty much gave us no indication. So whether or not that green light, or possibly it could be orange if you're into Teslas or whatever the case happens to be, whether or not there's a light present at all, we still need to understand how the circuit works. So what I have here is just a traditional J1772 style connector. And this is for level one and level two charging. So level one charging, lots of times we call that emergency, emergency charger. That's operating off 110 voltage. Level two is 220 voltage. Now you gotta remember the car's always in control as to how many amperage it will take from the charger. So we'll come back to that statement here in a second. But primarily there's five different terminals inside a J1772 style connector. And even if you're doing DC fast charging, you'll have a different style connector but the two small terminals are still needed. So it'll look different if it's DC fast charging, but you're still gonna have these other two terminals. So what are these other two terminals? First of all, the three big terminals, they are the two line voltages. So if it's a level one charger, only one of them are gonna have 110 volts of power on it. The other one's just gonna read zero. And then the bottom one happens to be ground. If it's 220, both the two top ones will each have, you know, let's say 110 volts of electricity on it, and the bottom one would have the ground. Now, <clears throat> the other two terminals that are inside this connector, this is where all the confusion comes from, because one of them is called a proximity detection, and the other one is called a control pilot. So, what is proximity detection? And we'll talk with that one first. Proximity detection is a physical connection from one of those small terminals over to the onboard charging module. And the onboard charging module is needed because when we're talking level two, which is J1772 style connections, we are giving the vehicle AC voltage. Now that AC voltage, as we all know, has to be converted to DC, and that's pretty much a job of the onboard charger. But we have other other circuitry inside the onboard charger, one of them is going to be a harness that connects the charger to the onboard charger to the actual charging port on the vehicle. Now, depending on what the car can handle, the resistance within that, that physical connection between this charging port and this charging module will differ. So for instance, if it could only handle, say, a 13 amp um, charge of some sort, so which is a pretty common thing for older types of plug-in hybrid style vehicles, we'd have like a 1500 ohm resistance in there. If it's a relatively newer one, you know, we might have a 100 ohm resistance, which could accommodate, you know, 80 plus amps or more. So that's why it's so important that we understand you know, this goes along with charging speeds of the vehicle, everything along those lines. We need to have a way to test that harness. So going back to the picture on the screen, if the car allows some type of light to occur when you plug into it, 
Well, they, you are basically testing that circuit. However, if you don't have, or if you're working on a vehicle that does not support that solid illumination of the light, then we need to understand how that circuit works. So this particular charging port, cut it off a car at a salvage yard, this one actually has 2,700 ohms of resistance that would go between the charging port and the vehicle's onboard charging module. And I can, I can show that to you pretty, pretty easily here. I'm just going to put my meter on ohms and I'm going to take my black lead and touch it to the ground terminal of this connector. And my red lead is kind of, it's kind of far down inside there. But there you can see we got the 2.699 ohms of resistance. So that is 2700 because we're on the, the K scale on here. So we would still normally need to test that because if for some reason it does not understand that there's a charging gun plugged into it, it's never going to allow the vehicle to start. So the conventional way that we always had to test that was we would have to find the vehicle's onboard charger, wherever it is, the one for demonstration purposes happens to be a Tesla, that's underneath the back seat, right? It's not real easy to get to. We would have to undo that harness. We can't test for that resistance while it's still connected. So we'd have to undo that proximity harness from the onboard charger, and then we could actually measure that resistance that's inside this, this J1772 port. And then once we know that value, we can, there's all kinds of internet sources, you can search it out and you can see, hey, 2700 ohms of resistance, or whether it's you know 90 ohms of resistance to 100 ohms, or whether it's 1500 ohms. You know, 1500 ohms, you do the, you look across the little bar graph and it'd tell you it's capable of charging at 13, 13 kilowatts, right? Which is not real fast, right? So that would be step one. Now, that alone could take some time. Number one, you'd probably have to figure out, if you didn't already know that's how you'd have to do it, you'd have to do the research on figuring out how you would test that circuit. Number two, you gotta take whatever you gotta take apart on the vehicle to get to that harness to be able to open that up and actually test it. So. The next wire that we kind of want to talk about is the control pilot wire. Now the control pilot wire is another wire that's in the circuitry, which we like to call the communication line between the vehicle and the charger. Now the charger itself will have a 12 volt signal. So I'll just kind of show that real quick. And I'm going to hold up a charger that I have I already powered up going into the wall outlet there. And I'm going to try to do this with one hand. But there I've got my 11.89 volts. So about 12 volts coming from the charger that's on the wall. It's a level two charger that's powered up. So what we're actually doing with the control pilot circuit is when I plug that into the electric vehicle, it will immediately tell the vehicle that there is a charger plugged in. If I were to test the control pilot circuit, not from the charger, but on the car side with no charging cable plugged in, I would have zero volts. Once I plug a charging cord in before it starts charging the vehicle, it's going to do a voltage drop on that to nine volts. That's the car's communication between the charger and the vehicle that's letting it know that there is a cord plugged into it and that the circuitry is testing good so far. Now, once we tell it to start charging the vehicle, that voltage will drop again to six volts and it will stay at six volts the entire time it's charging unless one of two things happen. Number one, the battery becomes 100% fully charged. Then it's gonna revert back to zero volts again. That's an easy one, pretty easy to understand. The other one is it'll drop it down to three volts. Now when it drops it down to three volts, the car can still charge, but it has sensed from temperature wise that it needs to go ahead and vent. 
So you might go ahead and start hearing some fans coming on on the vehicle, whatever the case happens to be to try to keep the temperature down inside the battery pack. And also if the charger, I guess, was to overheat, then obviously that would drop it down to three volts as well. So those are the common scenarios for the voltage of what level you're going to see. Now, how the vehicle knows what type of charger is plugged in. So we're plugged into one that can produce 12 kilowatts of power. Now, the way that it knows that is by changing the frequency that it sends that, in this case, it will be six volt signal along the data bus lines. So depending on if it was an 80 amp, a 50 amp, you know, a 240 amp, whatever amperage style charger it is, that's how it's going to know what type of charger you're plugged into by just monitoring that frequency. It's going to start at one kilohertz and then it's going to change accordingly depending on the type of charger. Now what's another type of information that's shared along those communication lines? Well, just like we said before, it needs to know a little bit about the charger. Well, one of the things that dictates how much amperage you start this charger is rated at is going to be the size of the wiring. So that all of this is all transmitted along those lines. So let's get back to the real problem, the real grief that we have as a technician. Vehicle comes into my shop and they say, hey, you know what? I plugged my car in all night long, or maybe it was over the weekend or whatever scenario happens to be. And when I unplugged it, it didn't charge the vehicle at all. So we know that there's two scenarios. It could be a faulty charger or it could be a problem on the vehicle side. The problem with the problem on the vehicle side has always been we have to all of a sudden spend a lot of time trying to figure out what that problem is. The other thing, another po uh, common complaint could be it starts to charge but it always shuts off before the vehicle ever gets fully charged, right? So that's one that's even more difficult for us to go ahead and diagnose. So what I did is I created a little test kit here and the first box, so there's two boxes total, the first box is going to be used to test the electric vehicle charger. So it requires 12 volts, so you'll actually just plug in the little volt power supply here. On the actual box itself, I have a, an actual little board that simulates us having it hooked up to a vehicle. Now I know there's, there's other manufacturers out there that make a tool like this, and they're pretty expensive, and they're pretty expensive because and this is just the first part of the tool that I put together, but they're pretty expensive because they're made for electricians. They're not made for technicians. So what's the difference? Well, those tools will actually be able to simulate ground faults and stuff along those lines. We as technicians don't care if the charger's wired correctly, right? I mean, how often would we actually fix that? If it was our own charger that we wired up, then obviously we would fix that. But a customer is not going to ask us to go to their house and rewire however they installed their charger. What we're primarily concerned about is the rest of it, the rest of the capabilities that this tool can do. So I can just go ahead and open up the charge port just like it would be on a car. I could take my charging gun from my charger and I can plug that in. And when I plug it in, the green light on my board should illuminate. If it illuminates, that's telling me that the proximity and the control pilot communication between the charger and the vehicle, because again, this little board simulates a car, is actually working. Now, the next thing that I'd want to do is to make sure that we're delivering voltage, right? So at this point, I've got a couple terminals on the front there. I'm just going to turn my meter to AC voltage and I can test both lines, line one and line two, and I should see about 110 volts, 120 volts per line. So there's uh, line one, this will be line two, and I've got 120 volts per line, because again, I'm hooked up to a 220 circuit, right? 
So once I did that, it takes a matter of seconds to do, I know that that lack of charging type of complaint is not a problem with the actual charger. So at this point, it's going to be on the vehicle side. Which brings me to my next point of the second part of the kit. The second part of the kit is 100% designed to actually test the vehicle side. So it's got its own little charging gun that you would end up plugging into the actual charging port on the vehicle. It's also got a charging port that you would actually plug the electric vehicle charger into. And then I have, again, I can sample line one and line two voltages, but also the control pilot. Now we don't have to really necessarily worry about the proximity at this point, because once I have it plugged in to the vehicle, we would know that the proximity detector is actually working properly. So we don't have to worry about that part of the circuitry anymore. Plus we might have a green light on on the dash or orange light or whatever the case happens to be. So I don't have an electric vehicle here just because I have about five videos I'm shooting today and I didn't want to take up the space. <coughs> but I do have this first box, which again simulates a car. So we can actually pretend like that first box is a car. Now, when I actually go ahead, we know that we had 12 volts coming out of the charger. When I actually go ahead and plug this into box number one, or box number two, I should say, instead of plugging this charging gun into the vehicle, we'll plug it into here because again, it has kind of like its own little vehicle on that little board that's in there. And then I should be able to, again, test line one and line two if you wanted to, but if you already tested the charger, you're gonna know that that's working. But primarily what I'm gonna be concentrating my efforts on is the control pilot side of things. And the control pilot side of things, again, I should see until the vehicle starts to tell it it wants a charge, I should see that 12 volts no longer be reading 12. It definitely shouldn't be reading zero, because remember zero means nothing's plugged in. It should be reading nine volts, which means it's plugged in, the control pilot, the communication between the onboard charger and the actual charger that's bolted to a wall or a post or wherever it is, is all intact. And then once the vehicle runs all those tests and it says, okay, I'm happy with this, then it can start to accept the charge. Now that part, you know, could be a little bit different. If it's your own personal one, it's probably going to not require you to scan a barcode or put a credit card in or anything like that. But if it happens to be a public one, you might have to, you know, put a credit card in or scan a QR code with your app, which is technically attached to your credit card, whatever the case happens to be. So with that being said, I'm just going to go ahead and do that real quick. So I should preface all of this with saying that there are reasons on an electric vehicle that could prevent the vehicle from charging. So it might not be a circuitry problem. If there's any high voltage related diagnostic trouble code stored, you're going to want to diagnose those first. Remember, the BMS has many jobs, but its primary job is to protect that battery. So let's just throw out there that, you know, a temperature sensor is faulty and I have a trouble code for, you know, a faulty temperature sensor. If the BMS doesn't know how hot the battery is getting, it's going to err on the side of caution and it's not going to allow you to charge a battery that's going to increase the heat, which maybe would be fine, depending if it's just like a bad sensor. But if it's actually going to increase the heat and there's no way to monitor that increase in heat, it's not going to allow you to even start the charging process. So always start your diagnostics by scanning for trouble codes. Now, with that being said, I'm going to pretend like I plug this tool into the car and then I'm going to plug my charger into my box here. Now, now that I got my box plugged in to pretty much the car, we saw that the proximity light came on because it knew that it had an actual cable plugged into it. I'm going to switch back my meter to regular voltage 
and I'm going to go ahead and measure the voltage. We're not charging. I'm going to measure the voltage here, and we saw that that 12 volts from the charger has dropped down to about 9.5 volts, which is exactly what we would expect it to do. Now, again, I could go and test those two line 1 and line 2 voltages there. Um, the only reason why I'd recommend doing that is if you didn't do the first step in the first box, then you wanted to see if the voltage was present. So let's put this into perspective. I know I have a good connection, so I know the proximity circuit's good, so I can forget about that. I know I also have communication between my charger and the onboard charger on the vehicle. So I can almost forget about that circuitry, right? Why do I mean almost? Well, I mean almost because if it's just that it wouldn't accept a the charge, then okay, I'm done. But however, if it's, a, if it's a complaint that said, hey, it starts to charge, but it always shuts off before it ever fully charges the battery, well, now I would want to you know, monitor that control pilot circuit the entire time while it's charging the vehicle. So I can do that with the scope. I can do that with a digital multimeter. It doesn't matter what I do it with, but I'd plug it in and I would start recording that because now we can see if there's something crazy going on, like halfway through the charging process, all of a sudden that communication line gets interrupted for whatever reason. Could be a could be a too high of resistance value that's going on there, maybe some green corrosion, something along those lines. It could possibly be that the battery itself is telling, the BMS itself is telling it to stop charging. And if that's the case, you'll probably have some diagnostic trouble code stored, which is why you want to use the scan tool as well to help you diagnose this. It could be something as simple. There's a lot of common faults out there. Um, we use a temperature sensor as an example before. A coolant temperature sensor problem in a Chevy Volt, that's a pretty common thing. A lot of you guys probably ran across that already. Um, that could actually prevent the whole charging process. Another common thing, since we have, happen to have it here on the table, is the Tesla onboard charger. There's two 50 amp fuses on the side of it. If one of those were to blow, then obviously it's not going to accept the charge either. So this is something that is very quick and easy. It's in essence, I call it the J1772 charging detective kit because it's a two part kit. But in essence, the first part, the first box one tests, tests the charger for us to make sure, you know, that was wired correctly and that's the faults not on that side. That's very quick and easy to, to go ahead and diagnose. And then box two is the one that really saves us a lot of time because it allows us to have a breakout box, if you will, between the actual car and the charger so I can pay close attention to the CP line on that. So if you happen to like this, you know, definitely check us out on our website. We've got way more detailed, in-depth articles on that website that talks about that charging circuits, talks about chargers, everything along those lines. And the other thing I want to ask for is I actually submitted that, this little kit that I did for a Motor Top 20 Tool Award this year in 2023. So when the voting opens for that, if you like what you saw, I'd appreciate your support by throwing a couple votes my way. Thanks for watching.